We return to our theme on discipleship and discovering more and more about what it means to live as a devoted disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in our series so far, we are tracking through with our discipleship diagram to realize that a disciple is one who is inwardly submitted to Christ, who is committed to the reality of his abide or to committed to abiding daily in his presence and transforming power, who so lives out his glory in their world that others are pointed to Christ. And in the lecture series at the moment, we are looking at what we mean by the different aspects of this diagram. We have already looked at the issue of submission and we have discovered that there are two very real elements in submission. There is our place as sinners who come to the foot of the cross in submission to the Saviour, acknowledging our sin, receiving his sacrifice on our behalf. There's the second part of submission where day by day as disciples we submit at the foot of his throne. Now forgive me for going over these things each time we, we re-embark on this uh, theme but these are such important things that I want them thoroughly embedded in your mind. And so coming out of that submission we enter into the thing we talked about last time as this abiding life. This life of drawing close, of remaining in, of living in fellowship with him step by step, day by day. We see there are issues of constancy and continuity. It's tied in with that I am the vine, you are the branches, where his life flowing in us and through us. We are not talking about a religion where we fulfill a set of rules and regulations. No, we are talking about a relationship where we allow the presence and the power of Jesus to be integrally involved in our lives every single day we live. It involves choices. The choices we make about what we do with our bodies, what we do with our minds. This issue of submission that we keep coming into again and again. The uh, principles and the disciplines of the spiritual life. And there are practices, there are things that we say, yes, I am going to do that. There are other things we say, no, I will not do that. And training our bodies, training our minds, training our spirits is something that comes with time. Now, there is the grace of God that is working in us by his spirit, but there are choices. There are things we say we will and we will not do. And there is a balance here, a tension between that which is our part and that which is God's part. We realize that so much rises out of these attitudes that we allow to ferment in our mind. And we're going to explore some more of that in our session today. And so we are moving on. Remember, we have got four distinct elements to our discipleship diagram and definition. Abiding in, uh, sorry, submitting to Christ abiding daily in the reality of his presence. Today we're looking at his transforming power. So let's look at it here. A disciple is one who is inwardly submitted to Christ, who is committed to abiding daily in the reality of his presence and his transforming power. Now I wonder if you've noted something here. Submission and the commitment to abiding in him are two things that we do which, if you like, create the environment, create the soil 
in which God can work. They are those things which we determine we can bring to this lifestyle of discipleship. But what happens as we come in this submitted abiding relationship, there is a transaction of grace that goes on whereby God releases more and more of the power of his Holy Spirit to be operative in our lives. And so this is the dimension that we are investigating today, this whole challenge of his transforming power. And so what I've really just been saying to you is this. There are two parts. Our part in the submission, his part. There is, in fact, really a divine partnership in operation here. It's not that God says, stand back, take your hands off, I'll do it all. No. And it's not, okay, you get on with it. Come on, if you measure up, I'll help. No, it's not either of those. It's a balance point between the two where we recognize our part and we recognize his part and these two work together. And so we see that and this glorious circle that operates. And the deeper I walk in this desire to abide in Christ, the more I'm creating an environment in which the Spirit can transform. And as he transforms, the more that releases the abiding and the desire to draw closer, and the more that opens the door for this transformation of the Holy Spirit. It's all there, operating step by step, day by day, in this beautiful partnership. Well, we want to explore for a few minutes this whole dimension of the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. I want us to look at some of the things Jesus had to say about the work of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to recognize that there was a context. Now, we're going to turn particularly to John's Gospel and John chapter 14, 15, 16, which is the primary pr place where Jesus talked about the ministry of the Spirit, the counselor, the comforter who he was sending, who would live with them. Now, as we have already discussed and will discuss later, that the context of this is Jesus' presence with his disciples the night before he went to the cross. And so he began to unfold for them this work of the Holy Spirit. Here's the first thing I want you to recognize. One of the things that Jesus said was, you know him for he lives with you, speaking of himself. And he will be in you. Now, that little word in is a very, very significant word. When we think about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to uh, embark on a much deeper study of the Holy Spirit later in the course, you will find uh, that we have a subject called the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at the Holy Spirit's ministry in the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit's ministry in the New Testament. And what we discover is that with the cross of Christ, we enter a whole new world. Prior to the death of Jesus, prior to the sacrifice for sin, you only read about the Holy Spirit being upon people. So the Holy Spirit came upon this one for that purpose. And in the Old Testament, we see this sense in which the Holy Spirit comes upon someone to release and empower them for a particular work that God had for them to do. And then there was this sense of when that work was done, the Holy Spirit was removed. Remember David in that great penitential psalm, Psalm 51, he prays, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Because in the time and, and, uh, uh, that David lived, there was this sense in which the Holy Spirit could not indwell. Why? Because no human life could be pure enough 
because the blood of Jesus Christ had not been shed to cover the price for all sin. Therefore, no human being could be pure enough to be a dwelling place of the Spirit. But Jesus says to these disciples, because I am going, you've got me with you now, but I am coming again in the person of my Spirit and I will be in you. And the whole beautiful thing about this, of the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence, we've already talked about this whole issue of being sealed for God, that when we come to Christ, you also were included in Christ. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and having received him, having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And so God has released not just upon us, not just around us, but in us. And the work of the Spirit within us to bring about this work of transformation. He is, in reality, the eternal presence of Christ living in the life of the believer. You've given your life to Christ. You've invited him to come and to be your Lord and your Savior. Then I can tell you the Holy Spirit lives in you. And don't you ever let anyone tell you differently. If you doubt that, you go to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. And you underline that in your Bible. And you hold it in your heart that you might know with assurance, this great truth. Well, there's another verse there in John. And John chapter 14 and verse 26. And Jesus talking again about the work of the Spirit within. But the Counselor, the Spirit, when he comes, he will teach you all things and he will remind you of everything that I have said to you. The work of the Spirit in the life of the believer is a comforting, counseling, guiding, teaching, reminding work. You know, sometimes uh, when we are being led in pathways that perhaps are not the best, there comes that quiet voice within that says, don't do that. Not a good idea. Now, some people would say, that's your conscience. Well, for people who don't know Christ, conscience might be a good title because the Spirit doesn't live within them. But for we who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and received him, the Holy Spirit's taken up residence. And the one who was saying, uh-uh, not a good idea. Don't go there. That's the Spirit. When you open the scripture and say, Lord, but I don't understand what that means. And you read it again and suddenly into your heart comes a beacon of light. And you think, aha, wow, where did that come from? That came from the spirit. The spirit is at work within you. He is our constant companion to make the things of Christ real in our lives. He is the one who interprets Jesus' heart and mind to us. Day after day, it is the Spirit within us. Let me give you just a simple example of that from my own life. I've been a preacher now for very close on 50 years. And through the years, I've come to realize that when I preach, it's much more about knowing what is on God's heart for this congregation that I'm speaking to rather than what I feel I should say. And so when I'm being called to preach somewhere in the weeks before I'm going, I simply sit down with the Lord. Lord Jesus, what's on your heart for these people? And then it's a process of waiting reading, thinking, praying. And then there will come a little flash, a little thought. And I say, ah, oh, so that's where we're going, Lord. 
And he will say to me, he will speak, he will give just a little flash of inspiration. He will give me a verse of scripture or a passage of scripture or a theme that he knows is needed in the life of the particular congregation to which I'm preaching. You see, he is the presence of Christ within me, guiding, instructing, teaching. Now, that's just an experience from my life and ministry. But I'm sure if you think about it, you could find places where the Holy Spirit of God has released to you guidance, direction. He is your counselor. He is your comforter. He will teach you the things of Christ. He will interpret the heart and the mind of Jesus to you. Look again, John chapter 16, verse 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, you think about before you came to Christ. Think about the process that drew you. Was it that... Maybe you had a revelation of Jesus, and that's happening for many people in these days, particularly people who've grown up in other faith backgrounds. Perhaps it was that you came under a deep sense of conviction that there were things in your life that were not right and that you needed to change. Do you think you came there on your own? No, you didn't. Before you even came to Christ, that was the work of the Holy Spirit within you saying, we can deal with that. Your life could be better if this wasn't involved. Oh, okay. You see, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And as believers, you know, we've already talked about this struggle we have between the old nature and the new nature. And sometimes the, new, the old nature rises up and gets the better of us. And then comes the quiet work of the spirit that says, can we deal with that? There's forgiveness if you'll come and agree with God about that sin in your life. We've talked about this issue of confession, of agreeing with God about our true situation. Yeah. These things are, are critical. These things are so important. And this is the work of the Spirit who guides us. He convicts of sin and points to the Savior. He's pointing the believer towards holiness. Do you see, the Holy Spirit knows that if you and I can live our lives day by day in that right relationship with God, if we can journey step by step in ways that release his heart and mind into our world, our lives are going to be so much better, so much more fulfilled. And so the Holy Spirit is at work within us to guide us away from that which is destructive and to draw us into that which is wonderful. Do you see these things about the work of the Holy Spirit? Think again. But when he, the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. Mm. Do you find many things in the scripture uh, at first reading at a little confusing? Do you find yourself sometimes thinking, well, I, I, I just don't understand that. Or maybe you're listening to someone speak and as that person is speaking, you're thinking to yourself, I'm not sure about that. It doesn't sound quite right to me. Well, here's where the Holy Spirit is working within us. When we sit and we open the scripture and we read and we say, God, I'm, I just don't get it. What are you doing here? If we will open our heart, there will come a light of understanding that the spirit brings. When you're listening to something or someone and, and an attitude is put forward and you think, I'm not sure about that. And you turn your heart to the Lord and say, Lord, will you show me? 
And over the next few days, there comes a dawning light and you say, no, I knew there was something wrong there. That's the work of the Spirit. Whether it is in the reading of Scripture or whether it is in the things that are happening around you, the Holy Spirit wants to work within you to guide you into all truth. He is the Spirit of truth. He reveals Jesus who says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And the Spirit's work is to lead us into all truth. Now, these are just a, a few of the things. Let, let's look at one more passage. John chapter 16, verse 14. He will bring glory by taking what is mine and making it known to you. You see, the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bring glory to Jesus. His whole purpose for existence is to lift up Jesus. To cause people to turn from their sin and turn to him. To help us realize the truth of the gospel so that our hearts are opened. To take us into the word and there to discover Jesus more and more. This is all the work of the Spirit. And constantly, the Holy Spirit doesn't want us looking at him. Yes, we need to understand his work, but he doesn't want us looking at him. The Holy Spirit wants us to look at Jesus. And his great delight is when we, in seeking the things in the word of God, in seeking the truth, in seeking to live in holiness, lift up our hearts to Jesus. That's his primary purpose. And so the work of the Spirit to glorify Jesus. And you know what? Jesus is glorified in the life of the devoted disciple. And so here we're seeing in these verses that we've looked at from Jesus' own teaching about the Holy Spirit, something of the way that God wants to work in you and me. Now look, there is so much, much, much more to learn about the work of the Spirit. We've just bounced across a few mountain peaks there. And as I said earlier, later in this uh, Foundation School of Ministry, you'll be able to enroll uh, in a course that speaks about the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you're looking online, in time that course will be available to you online and presented in, in much the same way as I'm talking to you here. Because there is much, much more to learn about the Holy Spirit and his work. But let's talk a little bit more now, because our emphasis is on transformation. Let's talk about the Spirit's transforming work. Now, the word that is used in the scripture to describe transformation is a Greek word, metamorpho. Now, if you were listening carefully, and if my accent was right, it ties in to an English word that we use to describe a process that I call the bug to butterfly, the process of metamorphosis. Now, what this word speaks about is to transform, to change, and it can speak about inward or outward transformation. So when we think about the, the bug to butterfly, so the butterfly lays the egg. The egg hatches in a suitable place and that caterpillar begins to devour voraciously the particular plant on which the egg has been laid. And the butterfly is very careful because he knows which plants suit his offspring or her offspring. And so what happens is as that uh, caterpillar gets to a certain stage, it crawls up and finds a comfortable place and binds itself up into this chrysalis. And there inside that chrysalis, there is a process of transformation taking place. 
whereby the bug that most of us would be repelled from is changed, is transformed. And what emerges from that chrysalis in due course is the beautiful butterfly. Now, this is something of the process of the work of the Holy Spirit in you and me. We've already interacted with Paul's words in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be, and it could really be, be continually being transformed. It picks up that Greek word we were talking a moment or two ago. And Paul loves this word. And what he is saying in this, and we could paraphrase it in this way, Christian, so open your, your heart and mind to the work of the Holy Spirit that he can transform your mind and even the very way you think. What Paul is saying in this work of transformation is if you will open your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to do his work, he can do a wonderful work inside you. My dear friends, we don't recognize the depth of transformation that we need. When we come to Christ and he makes all things new, it's just a starting point. He is gracious and he is gentle with us. And as we move on through our life and our journey, the Spirit lovingly, graciously, generously works within us to bring this work of transformation that enables us to grow more into the likeness of Jesus. Though I have been a Christian for the greater part of my life, he is still working in me transforming me, working out new things. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. But I have to cooperate with the Spirit by opening my heart and allowing him. And that's where submission comes in. Look again at this transforming work. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, And we who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory we are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory that comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. What Paul here is describing is this transforming work that is going on day after day after day. We who have come and opened our lives to Christ and said, Lord Jesus, come on in. I submit my all to you. I, I want to walk with you in this abiding relationship. What Paul says is that at times imperceptibly, at other times in dramatic ways, he is transforming us. The particular form of the word that Paul uses in this place has this idea of something which is going on and on and on. Can I share with you something the Lord has taught me? One of the things the Lord says to me very often is, Gavin, keep your heart open. For while your heart is open to me, I can do anything with you. But the day that you close your heart off and you become hardened to my spirit is the day I can't do any more. And so I'm challenged that as I grow older, as my opinions and my thoughts become perhaps a little more 
settled than they might have been in my younger years to keep my heart open to God. Sometimes I go places in our ministry as it takes us around the world and I see things happening. I think, oh, is that God? And I have some questions I have to ask. Is this glorifying Christ? Is the word of God being honored? Are, are people being brought in a, into a nearer work, walk with the Lord? If this had a place in my life, would, would it lead me into a deeper level of holiness? And if I'm going tick, 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 sometimes I have to come home and open my Bible and have a fresh look at my theology. Sometimes there are things that yet I find the Holy Spirit needs to work out and transform in my life. And so the Lord constantly says to me, son, keep your heart open. Keep your heart open. And it's my goal to keep an open heart to God until the day he says, come on, son, time to come home. Your work's finished. You see, this is the work of the spirit who wants to continue to transform us. The present and ongoing work of the spirit. And as we submit our lives not only to Jesus the Saviour, but to Jesus the Lord. As we live day by day in this abiding relationship, there is this ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, this glorious cycle that He is working out in us, step by step. From 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul tells us this, look, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, that is death, but we will be changed. Here's this same word, that same word metamorpho. We will be changed in the flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. There's that word again. Can I tell you, this is the great hope of the Christian. Am I going to ever become perfect while I live here in this body? <laughs> Not likely. Yes, God may be doing a work of grace in you and in me that is drawing us and shaping us more. But you know, there is a great day coming when that trumpet blast of heaven will sound and God will sweep up his own. And what this verse says to us in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. In another verse in scripture, it says, and we will be like him for we will see him. This speaks of the further work of the Spirit, when we will be changed to be like Jesus. Yes, we will be like him, transformed into his likeness. The mere sense of looking into his face. And in that moment, a work of grace and glory will take place. And all of these things of our humanity, all of those struggles, all of the need for discipline, all of that stuff will fall away and we will be changed forever. And this is the great final work of transformation that the Holy Spirit will bring about in our lives. And so as we talk about this wonderful work of the Spirit's transforming power within us, it, it brings us back to this bug to butterfly thing. Now, if we talk about the outcomes of transformation in the physical realm, well, yeah, it's the change of an outward form. In the natural, transformation is focused on the outward. You know, if, if you have known someone in a, a, a previous time in your life and 
they've been perhaps someone who was overweight and struggled with life and after some years you meet them and they become slim, trim, taut and terrific and, and you say, wow, what a transformation. Well, yeah, that happens. But when we are in the realm of the spirit, we are talking about the transformation of the inner life, something that is happening day by day. So you get it? I come and bring my submission to Jesus. I commit myself to abiding daily in the reality of his presence. And he releases that work of the spirit in me, which brings about this inner transformation. Now, the thing about inner transformation is this. It impacts the very deepest places of my life. When the Holy Spirit is transforming, he is interested not in just changing the outward things. Because he knows if he can get to those drives, those desires, those passions, those attitudes, those things that are deep down in who I am to those places of brokenness that need healing. The Holy Spirit knows if I will let him get there, he can do a real work of transformation deep in here that will then be reflected in the outward. You see, it's this inner work, transforming not our outward appearance, but transforming our very inward nature. Now, one of the ways that this is expressed in the scripture is in Galatians chapter 5 in terms of the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What Paul is saying in this is that when you allow the Holy Spirit to do his work, when you, by your submission and abiding, create an environment in which the Holy Spirit can do his work, there will be certain outcomes. Just as we talked in uh, an earlier teaching session about the vine, what was the desire of the gardener in planting a vine? That there would be fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Well, this is what the Holy Spirit desires to bring out in us. And when we create this environment by our submission and abiding, and, and we partner with the Holy Spirit in this work of transformation, when all of this is happening, we don't have to think, now hang on, how can I be more joyful? How can I be more loving? How can I be more patient? Have you ever prayed the prayer, Lord, give me patience and do it quickly? Now we laugh at that. But the bottom line is, patience isn't something that comes naturally if that's not our nature. But the Holy Spirit transforming the inner self can take someone who is in, in, uh, impatient by nature someone who is impulsive. That's the word I was looking for. The Holy Spirit can take someone like that and by doing a deep work within, he can bring out this patience. He can take someone who is always uptight and stressed and by the work, the transforming work of the Spirit, he can bring out peace. And these are the beautiful fruit, the beautiful outcomes of this work of the Holy Spirit within us. The natural outgrowth of the work of the Spirit who is alive and working within us. We could look at this matter of the outcomes of the Spirit and talk about it in this way. It's to do with us 
cooperating with the Spirit. And so the foundational principles of cooperating with the Spirit, a lifestyle of submission, building that abiding relationship so that my heart desire is day after day after day to live in that close, close, close relationship with Jesus, that relationship of intimacy. The choice that rises out of that environment of abiding, the choices to live a lifestyle that is different, to be different. And it's that cooperation with the Holy Spirit that enables him to do this work of transformation. In Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, Paul picks up some very crucial areas of our cooperation with the Spirit. He says, See, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. In other words, you, you don't live any longer in the way the world does. You've made a choice to be different. The things that are part of the world's way are no longer part of the life you live. You've chosen to be different. In this passage, he, he, he said, he, he's very firm about it. He says this, I tell you this, indeed, I insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live in the way the people of the world live. Hmm. He goes on to say, in the futility of their thinking, darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God due to the ignorance that is in them. Wow. It's a pretty devastating statement, isn't it, about the situation. But you think about the world around us. And he says, no, you did not come to know Christ in this way. He said, when you came to know Christ, you put on a new self. OK, therefore, you must put off. We talked a little bit about this garment we take on and off in our last teaching session or an earlier teaching session. He says, therefore, there are things that have no place in your life. Falsehood, anger, stealing, unwholesome talk, bitterness, sexual immorality, impure thinking and more. There are choices to be made that says, no, not going to have those in my life. No room for that. But put on a new self. And when he talks there in verse 24, he says this. Therefore, you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully. Now, let's go back earlier. Verse yeah, 24. And put on a new self, which is being created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Look, I hope you're getting the message I'm bringing through. If we come to our discipleship diagram, a disciple is one who is inwardly submitted to Christ, who is committed to abiding daily in the reality of his presence and transforming power. What I hope you're seeing is this partnership, this transaction that is going on. That as I actively cooperate with God through seeking day by day to live a life that is submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to abide in the reality of his presence, to fill my life with the things that are those practices and disciplines of the Christian life, to seek that relationship of intimacy, to allow his grace to work out. What I'm doing is creating this environment where the Holy Spirit can do his work. And what will be the outcomes of that Holy Spirit work? It will be these beautiful fruit of the Spirit and more and more. And that's what the world will see when they look at this one they've known whose life is in the process of being transformed. They're going to look and see and they're going to say, wow, what is it? 
in our next teaching session. I'm going to take you into this subject of living reality. What do we mean when we talk about living a life that displays the reality of Jesus? What is it that enables us to live a life that the world around us can look at and say, that person's got something. I want it. Now, as you follow on from this class, I want you to pick up uh, your little book, Journey into Discipleship. And right about the middle of the book, you're going to find a study entitled Living a Transformed Life. I want you to work on that. It's not complicated. It's simply going to take you again into some of these passages of Scripture and ask you to think about some of the things that we've talked about today and give you an opportunity to reflect upon that. If you're doing this course online, you will find at, at, on the uh, internet page where you've accessed this lecture, there is some feedback, opportunity to respond to two or three things and then to reflect that back to those of us at Foundation School of Ministry and we will get back to you. I trust that you are coming into a deeper understanding of what it means to be a devoted disciple of Jesus. That our definition and our diagram are opening things for you. May God bless you as you think about the things we've been studying together today. <music>